I'm Matthew Bishop of The Economist, and I'm here with Nagib Sawiris, who uh, is former chief executive of Arascom Telecom, and also founder of a political party in Egypt. And a year ago, I was on this stage with Randy Zuckerberg and Chris Hughes, getting terribly excited about the technological potential of social media to drive revolution as we saw the Arab Spring beginning. Uh, really, around this weekend, I think things were happening in Tunisia, starting to happen in Egypt. And I think the starting point of our conversation now is this sort of growing sense that what was so exciting a year ago is all going a bit wrong, certainly in Egypt. I mean, Tunisia seems to be going reasonably well. So I just, I'd love to start there, Nagy, with your, your sense on, you know, what's your progress report at the moment? How is it, how is it going? Is it going wrong? Well, I have to say that uh, I'm not usually by nature a pessimist, but I'm now in a, in a pessimistic mood. So you need to discount that out of what I'm going to say. I think uh, as far as I'm concerned, I, I mean, uh, and uh, I always think that the West doesn't see that because we all cheered for the revolution. I was someone who sided with this revolution in day one during the Mubarak regime and taking a lot of risk. Uh, but we had to all watch how this revolution was hijacked by extremists uh, from day one. Starting mid-February, uh, the revolution was hijacked. All these genuine, well-minded, uh, well-hearted uh, 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 young people who did the revolution just went home and left. Uh, I always say that they went home and left the square to be uh, kidnapped, you know. So the, in essence, since that, uh, revolution, we, are, uh, we have moved from a, a revolution that included all the liberals, the seculars, the, the young, uh, the old, the poor, the rich, the intellectuals, the artists, the religious people, but everybody together, everybody some, somehow seems to have disappeared and only the ultra-religious forces took over and as you have seen in the last election too, which uh, many people think they were uh, uh, fair and square, which I don't share. I have seen a lot of mis-achievements uh, in these elections. Uh, and they took 75% of the parliament, which could never be a re real reflection of the Egyptian people. And therefore, the fear right now is that we will move from the dictatorship of Mubarak and Ben Ali and Gaddafi and all these guys into a, a religious dictatorship, which then brings the picture of the Iranian revolution back to our mind. But at the moment, I mean, the perception that a lot of outsiders have is that the Egyptian military is clinging to power too much. I mean, the Human Rights Watch came out yesterday with a report saying, you know, you in the West need to overcome your anti-Islamic uh, prejudices and support the democratic voice of the people. So you, you don't buy that view that the military is being the main sticking point in no, Egypt? No, I don't buy these two views. I don't buy the first view that they're sticking. I'm sure they will leave in June 30th, as they said. And I also don't tell the West, uh, no, just be nice to, the, the West should protect the, uh, and prevent uh, all these Arab Spring countries from falling into another dictatorship. I am frustrated at the West not seeing the danger of that. And, you know, I mean, whenever someone comes, we get some congressmen and senators, they visit Egypt, they go to the Tahrir Square, take some pictures, <laughs> meet the military, meet these guys, and think, wow, this was a great thing, you know. And then we have to, the ones who live there, we will have to, see a, a liberal, modern country uh, kicked back into the old ages, you know. So what went right in Tunisia that didn't go right in, in Egypt? It's, uh, it's the difference of the nature of the two countries. Tunisia was always very, very strongly secular. The women there are very strong. They've always uh, cherished their freedom. And uh, uh, that's one element. In Egypt, we have a, a lot of, uh, and a big mass of religious, poor, uh, un, uh, dip, uh, unprivileged uh, citizens uh, that think that religion and so is going to solve all their uh, problems. The second point, which is a very interesting point, the Nahda party of Tunis and Sheikh Anushi is quite, uh, for an Islamist, is quite an open-minded Islamist. Our guys are really more into the extreme, uh, and uh, that's a fundamental uh, difference because we would love to have a, uh, a Turkish type of an Islamic state. That would be really the perfect, the perfect Islamic model right now in the region for an Islamic state is Turkey. When Erdogan came to Egypt, the first thing he told the Muslim brotherhoods, 
I'm a Muslim uh, leader for a secular country, right into their eyes. And this was a big shock to them because they hailed for him and so on. Um, so Tunisia worked because it is a secular country. Um, Egypt, it, this is being played out. I don't know, what, what, what's your central, my, your my, central scenario for what happens in Egypt over the next I, two I or think, three years? I uh, think two things. I mean, I think they will be very restrictive on rights, free rights, rights of you to dress, to eat, to walk, to live the way you want. There will be restrictions also on media and culture. So I am quite uh, pessimistic. On the economy, I'm not, because uh, uh, Islam as a religion embraces the free economic model, and therefore I'm not uh, worried on that segment uh, long term. On short term, the country is really on the verge of bankruptcy. If we continue with this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, we have a lot of demonstrations, a lot of strikes, uh, uh, our, our deposits are shrinking, our currency is under pressure, so we have a lot of challenges uh, in front of us, which could turn into really ugly in six months unless something happens, you know. And then we've had Libya. Libya is a disaster. Libya, the difference between Libya and Tunisia is the Islamists in my country were not armed. So we went with Twitter and Facebook and, and all the social media. This was our weapon. Now in Libya, they, all these Islamists, each one has an army. Whatever they don't like, they go and occupy the building and so on, and they haven't been successful till now. I shouldn't be laughing about that because it's really a serious thing, you know. But uh, it's going to be a very challenging uh, uh, problem to defuse the situation and collect these arsenals of weapons, you know. Just uh, yesterday, they invaded the prime minister's and the president's uh, headquarters and so, uh, so you think that's going to remain a basket case for quite a while? Or? I think uh, Libya will be unstable for a while, yeah, until someone really has the power and guts to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, clear the, uh, uh, or move the weapons from the hands. It's a beautiful country, the people are beautiful. Uh, there's a lot of potential, uh, but I think it's the duty of the West. Also, again, now you can't just go and make a mess like in Iraq and leave. You know, I mean, it's just like, if you leave Libya today with all the weapons in the hands of these forces and not help the legitimate government that has been elected to uh, restabilize security, we're all asking for a big disaster. It's like if we all also shrug our hands while the Middle East is fine because these problems will be exported back to Europe. If we have an exodus, you have 15 million Christians living in these Arab countries who are frightened shitless right now, sorry for the word, but they're really frightened. Uh, because of this extremism. So if you just shrug your head and said, no, it's a, it's a democracy, we can't, and it's going to be a problem. We need to watch the situation. We need to help these countries move, stand on their foot, build their economies, regain the authority of the... Of and the your sense at the moment is that the West has just said, okay, we, you know, we, we provided NATO, we helped overthrow Gaddafi, but now we're walking away and you can sort out the mess yourselves. What's your sense? I, you're closer to it than I am. I mean, I, that would be my sense. It does seem I, to be. I don't see anything there's happening. Nothing, there's nothing I see. I went going to Tripoli myself. I met the president of the forum. During our meeting, I heard bullets being shot all the time, and they were not celebrating bull, bullets. So, and I walk in the streets. So everybody has a clashing cough, and they, you know. And in Cairo now, you can go in the supermarket and buy Libyan arsenal uh, airplane hunters and tank, and everything you want to buy. You know, so it's a mess. And then we have Syria, which is probably the, one of the more troubling, difficult situations. I mean, how should that, what, what's going on there? I think, I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible how leaders just don't get the lesson. I mean, Syria, he gets the Oscar for being the, I mean, he, uh, sorry, I mean, I, I have to find the polite word, but he's seen four movies, the same movies, and he didn't learn anything. And the lesson is very simple. Once the blood floods on the floor, you have to go. If you decide to shoot your own people, you're, you've wrote, written the end of your regime with your own hands. But I mean, in that sense, was, was going after the death penalty for Mubarak a huge mistake? Because it did send this message to people that, you know, once you get to that point, you might as well stick around and fight it out because you're gonna, you know, there's no, no, there's no, no sort of smooth no, exit, no, is there? So, sorry, it sends a message that you should not be shooting your people. <laughs> It sends a message, don't shoot your people so you don't end up like Mubarak being accused. It doesn't, uh, no. What I'm saying is the president should have learned that shooting the people is not the solution. So he let his 
entourage do that, and we and any human being with a conscious, including myself, cannot sit there and watch this happening and saying it's none of my business. No, you know, and therefore he will pay the price. I don't think that Syria will be resolved amicably. His only choice is to find some immunity, like Ali Saleh got the immunity after killing 50,000 people. Also, I mean, uh, you know, at least he has now only 3,000 or 4,000. He should just. Uh, try and break a deal where he leaves with his family and, and, and surrenders the, the rule to a democratic elected government, even if the Islamists come. Because so you would have been happy for Mubarak to have that deal that he could have left Egypt and gone off I into exile? I actually, actually, I participated in, in a movement that was trying to avoid that scenario. The scenario, we, we formed a, a committee of the wise, we called it, which we tried to persuade Mubarak to leave amicably, so the army would not take over and another civil uh, government would come in and the country could move into democracy without surrendering to any of the forces. Because in Egypt, there's a very big opinion that our army and the Islamists have a deal. So all this scenario of elections and so on is, 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 is a scenario, but the real deal has been done from day one between the Islamists and the army. I mean, wasn't that in a way the Turkish arrangement after Ataturk in a way? No, look, first of all, you see, you said what you said. You said after Ataturk. Our problem in Egypt, we never had an Ataturk. I wish we had an Ataturk so he would enlighten us and, and reform us, and then we could move back to our roots so we are balanced. The problem is in our countries, we never had an Ataturk. So uh, uh, the military take over, and there are no, I mean, you, I have to be careful. Uh, the character of a military man is not really the most enlightened character. <laughs> but you're expect so back to Syria though, you're expecting that to get worse, there to be a civil war, or something of that kind. Yes, Turkey to I get see, I see. Turkey and other countries getting more and more sucked uh, yes, in. I see no other way. Because you know, if you put if unless someone because he revoked yesterday the the, the Arab uh, uh, what do you call it, Arab um, League told the President Bashar that he should try to broker a deal where he leaves the authority to uh, another uh, intermediary and he will get amnesty for that and he didn't take it. So I think the scenario will be the same uh, like Libya, which is uh, really uh, sad. So I, I want to look at this question of technology because I guess a year ago we were debating the, Ma the Malcolm Gladwell hypothesis and we were all being very cynical about Gladwell not getting it that in fact, you know, technology was capable of driving out dictators producing democracy and utopia and happiness and everything. Um, and now it, I mean, what, what, what's your reflection on the role that technology can play and what it can't do in terms of bringing about social transformation of the kind that you know, we were getting so excited about in the Arab Spring? I'm, st I'm still excited. I don't think there is uh, any reason to uh, uh, contemn the technology. If we didn't have Twitter and Facebook, the Egyptian revolution would have not have happened, and Tunisia too. So we are grateful to these uh, social medias because people could get organized and so on. And regardless of the fact that you think governments are prepared for it, they're not prepared. They don't have the innovation. They don't know how to deal. If you ask any functioner in my country or a minister of interior, he doesn't even have a, you know, a Blackberry or he doesn't have an internet. Or, for them, these are like hocus pocus fairs, you know, they still read the, old books and so on. So <laughs> if we, the young people, and you know what the, these young people did? They embarrassed us which were, who were not so young. Because we, I felt, you know, I, just weeks before this revolution, I was up to here, I was fed up from the regime, but I didn't see this coming. So these young people came with their organization, with their hot blood and their good notions, and turned into these democracies and, and liberated the country. The problem is that the outcome is not really what we want or we expected, so that's another problem we need to deal with. But that doesn't make the old regimes right. You see, when George Bush was saying, uh, you have to democratize, you have to do that, I always used to tell them that he doesn't know that these leaders are conflicted. It's a conflict of interest for them to, to um, entertain democracy. It will only happen by force. And that's what happened. The young people forced them out with this technology, so you need to be grateful to this technology. But are, are there lessons that we can learn from, you know, what, what bits of technology, what uses of technology were more effective, what didn't work so well that would help inform 
future movement? Well, what didn't work so well that uh, people like me, who have the largest mobile company in Egypt, agreed to sign a license that said that the security forces had the right to shut down the service. So when they came to ask me to shut down the service, uh, and the lawyers told me, if you don't shut the service, you will be, first, uh, the license will be revoked, and uh, you might end up in jail, and you have a fiduciary uh, duty towards your shareholders because you're destroying value because you just uh, lost your license because you, you refused to obey. So when we had a discussion, uh, I was a member of a committee lately in Egypt now to rewrite the law uh, of the telecom. So I found the same, <laughs> the same annex with different words that in certain cases we might be allowed. So I asked the new minister after the revolution, can you explain to me what is the new circumstances that will allow you to shut down the circumstances? So he told me sometimes we have uh, national disasters, so there could be a huge, I told him, look, I can fix anything for you. I mean, when it's a national disaster, we'll give priority to the SOS calls and all that. We don't need to shut the service. So it means that the revolution was made, but the minds never changed. They need, they want to keep the right to shut people or to shut, up, shut people Although, up. I mean, this is what David Cameron's first reaction was to the riots in London in the summer as well, wasn't it? How do we, how do we stop people using their BlackBerry instant messaging to... To, to, to organize riots. So there does seem to be, I mean, no, that, that just seems wrong, to be the nature the wrong of power comment. That, With all respect to him, he's a likable person. No, it's the wrong comment. The right comment is how do we avoid that people don't have a, enough future, they don't have a job, they don't have a decent house, they can't get enough uh, food and, uh, and feel that they are treated like animals. That's the right thing he needs to tackle, not to shut down the, the BBMs and the Twitter so they can't meet, you know. His duty is to provide to see why these young people in a very highly modern, good place like England uh, uh, have, what problems do they have, and that's what he needs to go and, uh, and solve. But you Not mentioned to... jobs. I mean, what, what's your current feeling about how the, your, your region is going to solve this huge oh, my, youth unemployment problem? My, my region is in a very serious uh, situation. I mean, Libya is lucky. It's a rich country. But the difference, that's why I'm very pessimistic for Egypt. If you have these fundamentalist regimes that lack the oil and finances. You see, my only hope that there will be, uh, that this is an extreme choice, what we have now, and that over time people will rebalance and will come back to a more moderate state because Egypt does not have the luxury Iran had for 30 years, and that is oil. So they will be confronted with massive problems economically that can only be treated if we all accept each other. But if they start saying that, well, we don't like Mr. Saviris because he's Christian or he's liberal or he's ultra-modern or like that, and he needs to adhere by this or by that, uh, they lose people like us, you know, because we will not uh, be happy to live with any restriction to our freedom or our belief. So fundamentally, you think the economy and there's not going to be the opportunity there for all sorts of people? No, I, I think, look, the country is going to go through a difficult time economically. We have a lot of unemployment. We do not have a reserve of oils. We have depleted our reserves, and we need to really, we will, Egypt will be facing real challenges. And the only way out of that, if the newcomers in presence don't act in a new dictator, dictatorial manner, because the fact of things is they have 75% of the parliament today, and they can shrug their uh, back, anything will say, they can just uh, uh, ignore. It's a very dangerous situation. I personally believe it's going to be worse than what it used to have. Um, I want to ask you, you're a Twitter user, and it got yeah. you into a bit of trouble because you tweeted a picture of Mickey and Minnie Mouse in Islamic attire, and that the, the, the authorities uh, were unhappy with you in, in that sense. Not, not the authorities, some extremists. I mean, we Egyptians, we were very known to like to joke. I mean, we crack jokes every five minutes, you know. So it was not meant to upset anybody. Uh, the, the government has said that there won't be any religious uh, parties. All what I did is I said, OK, if this party wins, that's how Mickey and Minnie would look like, you know. And it was not meant to offend <laughs> any religion. I didn't see any religious view in it. I'm very careful, you know. Actually, you know, I'm, I don't like But you're not going to commit Twitter side as a result of the reaction to your... your Sorry? Tweet. You're not going to shut yourself down on Twitter as a result of the reaction to that? No, I, look, uh, I'm a guy that if you shoot at, he goes forward. He doesn't go back. I, the more, he t the more uh, you, you shoot at me, the more I go forward. So I'm not going to... I apologize because I didn't see any religious 
uh, mini, I mean, what is the religious about Mickey and Minnie dressed in a funny suit, you know? So I apologize like 10 times or hundreds of times because, I mean, I, I, I grew in a Muslim country. All my friends are Muslims. I respect Islam. So I wouldn't do anything to uh, insult any religion, you know? And actually, when they had this movie, you know, The Last Temptations of Christ, I didn't go to the movie because I don't like movies that make a, a joke about, uh, you know, the religious issues. Of, Hmm. I want to finish just by asking you about Iran, because that's the other uh, big power in the region where I guess we had this sense, those of us that were using Twitter, that somehow this was going to be the, in a sense, the prelude to the Arab Spring with uh, everyone turning their faces green on, on Twitter. And, uh, and do you think Iran is going to be the next country where the social media revolution really does happen? I, I, I not just think so, I am sure of so. The, the, you, need just, you need to analyze the situation. Now, Iran, is it a dictatorship or not? It is a dictatorship. It is a religious dictatorship, okay? Uh, is the current regime sane? No, we have a guy who was uh, landing guy who says, Israel can go and burn in hell or I, we, would, we should not be there and the whole country wants to wipe up, uh, whole country. The young bloggers, what the Iranians are doing, and, is, and it is very, very worse than what they, and they managed to do it, and the Arab leader dictators couldn't do it, is they go home, they take the blogger from his house, they lock him in, and his parents never see him again. They've done that to at least 1,000 Iranian bloggers, and therefore they have arranged themselves in a, in a social media welfare or, or warfare, you know, that is enabling them to attack at the minute of the rising of uh, this, uh, let's say, call it the social media revolution, you know. So the problem in Iran is that the regime has equipped himself with, let's say, anti-social media devices that is making it more harder. But that doesn't change my uh, perception that the Arab Spring will go to Iran and it will happen because you cannot oppress your people the way they are doing right now and get away with it. And also, you cannot be a regime that is opposing the whole world and uh, you want to have a nuclear bomb, it was like the Gaddafi's nuclear bomb. You know, if, you, if Gaddafi was not an insane guy, you might have tolerated the bomb. But, but a bomb with, with someone who you think is not totally normal is a little bit... Uh... I mean, at the time of uh, the, the, when, when there was that sense that Iran you know, captured the imagination of everyone on Twitter, I mean, there was this tremendous outside appetite to help. Um, help the Iranian bloggers and so forth. What do you think outsiders like us can actually do? Um, what role should we be playing through our social media in supporting uh, people in countries that are trying it, to struggle for freedom? It is a very big role because, I mean, they, it's not enough to have a big appetite. We have to be doing something positive. I, frankly speaking, I have helped in every revolution. I mean, even in the Libyan revolution, you had this session in the morning, uh, what the, I, I have helped restoring some of the communication in Libya during the uprise against, uh, and I sent equipment and so on. So what we can do is, the minute we know of a blogger that has been, let's say, hijacked from his house, anybody in Iran should send us his name, and then we do a worldwide campaign with his picture to put the regime under pressure that you are acting illegally, you're putting people into, uh, like what happened with the Chinese dissident. It's just they need to feel that they can't go and continue doing that and we are all going to live our own life every day like that. They will be accountable and we, so if one day or whatever reason someone is bombing them, the world has seen what they are doing. But if they get away with it, they continue with it, you know. Well, I think on that challenging note, um, Nagib Sagwaris, thank you very much. <laughs>